there. Thank you so much for tuning in to this educational video. This is a part of the Professional Development Basic Series brought to you by the Audiovisual Division of the American Translators Association. My name is Xijing Xian and I'm an ATA Certified English into Chinese and Chinese into English Translator. Today, we're going to explore the four cornerstones of your experience in subtitling. First, a few words to contextualize this presentation. I have been translating professionally since 2014, and I branched out into the audiovisual field in 2018. So this is based on my almost five years of professional experience as a subtitle translator and QCR. For those who are not familiar, QC stands for quality control. So I also edit other people's translated subtitles to make sure that they're up to the standards that we're looking for. I primarily work on streaming and entertainment content. So that'll be the focal point for today. Everything I share today is based on my practice from English to a simplified Chinese translation. I believe the broader ideas I'm sharing are applicable to all languages, but do make sure to adapt the best practices to the particularities of your own language combinations and directions. And lastly, today we're covering not just the translation part, but also the technical part of the audiovisual translation process. We're not going to the nitty gritty of how to use a software, but I'm talking more about the decision making process of utilizing the tools so that we can bring the best viewing experience to our audience. Here you see four sets of unique characteristics of audiovisual translation. So what we're going to do is that we are going to deep dive into each of these segments, talking about common issues, best practices, and together they make up our four cornerstones of audiovisual viewer experiencing subtitling. So first up, idioms, slang, and culture. As you can imagine, in dramas and in movies, there are a lot of idiomatic expressions, slang terms, and cultural references. Needless to say, accurate translation is the first cornerstone of audiovisual viewer experience because if our translation is incorrect, our audience is not even getting the right story, which is definitely not something we want. So as a QCer, I want to highlight three specific issues that I see a lot in terms of translation accuracy. The first issue is what I call mistranslations hide in plain sight. This happens when a linguist is on autopilot or is not fully engaged with the context at hand. My favorite example in this regard is the simple expression, I don't know, because a lot of times when I see I don't know in the original English file, I get 我不知道 as the Chinese translation, which means I don't have the information or I don't know the answer. The problem is that's not always the right rendition. Let's say somebody says subtitling is so easy. I might say, I don't know, it can be really challenging. So in this particular context, it no longer means I don't have the information. It actually means I don't agree with what you just asserted. So it's really important for us translators to always be awake and alert when we're doing translation because some part in this translation process, this linguist should pause and think, wait a minute, I don't think I don't know means what I think it means because something is not adding up in this particular context. And to have that sort of inner alarm system triggered should be able to prompt us to look for the correct solution. The second issue I want to highlight is hidden messages uncaptured. This usually has to do with an insufficient level of mastery of the source language, which results in genuine difficulty with understanding the finer or nuanced parts of the language. And again, let's look at an example. Let's say somebody barges into your office and starts to ask a series of questions. You might say, hello to you too which is not a genuine greeting. By saying hello to you too, you are sarcastically implying the lack of hello on the other person's part. And we see a lot of variations of this in dramas and movies. Somebody might say, nice to see you too, 
which means you didn't seem very happy when you see me, right? So we want to make sure that we're translating, we're delivering the right message to our audience because this is so essential to storytelling. If you're finding yourself struggling with this type of language, I think you will notice this is very different from school English, right? So you want to make sure that you are actually watching a lot of shows and movies and spending time on social media because these are the, ha the natural habitats for idiomatic expressions, land terms, and cultural expressions. So by immersing yourself in these very authentic use cases of language, you really get to understand the English language on a deeper level, which will greatly contribute to the accurate translation of your subtitling work. The third issue is unidiomatic or unnatural renditions. So they usually come out really stiff and awkward and they give your audience a really jarring experience because the wording just doesn't sound like something a native speaker will say. This usually happens when the linguist is heavily influenced by the phrasing or the wording of the source language. So they're looking at the source and then they're typing out the equivalent in their target language, word for word, which will make the translation sound really stiff and awkward. So instead of thinking of translation as an exercise going from point A to point B, it's really helpful to Think about it as a process that goes from point A to point B to point C. And this is what I mean. So when you're looking at a source text, what you want to do is that you want to extract the idea and the message and the intent. And then you want to ask yourself, how do I express this thought into my target language? Because words are just vehicles for thought, right? So in this case, it's truly literally the thought that counts. So by going from A to B to C, you're not so influenced by the original phrasing and you want to, and then you can make sure that your translation sounds really natural and idiomatic. Here's a quick review of what we talked about so far in terms of achieving better translation. We want to have our inner alarm system engaged at all times so that we are noticing congruities and we're not misguided by our blind spots. And secondly, we want to work on our input so we're always learning and exposing ourselves to the latest linguistic developments in both of our working languages so that we are understanding the source text correctly and we can also render it in a really relevant and idiomatic way. And lastly, we want to focus on the message and the intent, not so much the word for word equivalence. And now let's move on to our second segment plot, lines, and characters. So these are essentially our storytelling elements. So in this segment, I want to highlight the importance of having a script writing mindset because our translation is viewed as the replacement of what the actor is speaking on the screen in the different language, right? So we want to make sure that our translation actually works with the plot line and that it sounds like a line meaning a speech instead of a written text, even though it is written. And then we also want to make sure that it really works with a character. So again, I am going to highlight three specific issues in this segment. And the first issue is not grasping the whole context. We say in translation, context is king, right? And in audiovisual translation, we have three, and this is so important to realize that your source text is only a third of the entire context in audiovisual translation, because you're not just working with the text, which is usually the transcribed audio or the script. We're also working with the audio element and the visual element. And these three together make up the entirety of the context, which should tell you that we should not even attempt at making translation decisions 
only based on the source text, right? So let me show you some examples to really drive home this point. So let's say our template or the source text we're given says, I should deliver this package. But if you're actually watching the movie, you might figure out that this person actually says, I should deliver this package. Then we're kind of having a different situation, right? Because now your source text is really no longer, I have the obligation to deliver this package. It's actually a debate about who should be the person to deliver the package. I hope this simple example really demonstrates to you the importance of audio delivery and how that really gives our text a different flavor. So accordingly, you also want to add the same seasoning to make sure that your audience is getting the right flavor as well. So earlier we saw an example of text and audio. Now let me show you an example demonstrating the interaction between text and visual element. So again, a very simple line of text, are you alone? And maybe you're tempted to translate it in a certain way. But if you're actually watching the movie, you'll see that this person is speaking to two people because the context is that these three women, they are running away from some dangerous man. And the first woman already makes it inside a safe room. Now the two other women finally catch up and they also want to hide inside the room. So this woman is asking the two people, are you alone? So now the actual source text is no longer are you by yourself. It's actually, is it just the two of you? And in this particular instance, it was a telltale sign for me that the translator was not watching the movie and they were just working on the translation based on the source text itself. The second issue I want to talk about is switching subtitle orders arbitrarily. So let's look at an example. Let's say we're just working on our conventional text-based translation, and this is something said by a mother. So she says, I'll let you play with your friends if you do your homework first. The interesting thing about this translation in Chinese is that in Chinese, we typically put the if clause at the front of a sentence. So if this particular switch doesn't apply to your language, I definitely encourage you to think of parallel examples where some kind of syntax switching is involved when you translate from your source to your target, okay? And now, Imagine we are in a movie now, and let's say when the mom says, I'll let you play with your friends, we're gonna have a reaction shot at the kid who looks really excited because he's thinking about playing with his friends. And then the mother is gonna continue and said, if you do your homework first. Okay, so now with this context or this visual imagery in mind, I think you'll agree that we can no longer translate it the way we usually do in our conventional text-based translation. Because now if we put the if clause in the front of the sentence, just as we will usually do, it doesn't really work anymore because why would the kid look excited if the mom actually says, if you do your homework first, right? So in subtitling, we need to do a different kind of recasting. And this is a really essential skill so that we're not disrupting the intended storytelling order. So for example, now in my translation, instead of if, which would necessitate the front loading of the if clause, I'll just rephrase it into but, so that my translation now reads, I'll let you play with your friends, but you need to do your homework first, which is exactly what the storytelling is about and it provides a harmonious viewing experience for the viewer. Now let's look at another example. Again, let's just say this is a traditional text-based translation. 
I want to live in a world where the grass is green, the roses are red, and the sky is blue with you. Okay. And now if we are to translate this into Chinese, this is the usual reordering. Okay. So you'll become, I want to live with you in a green grass, red rose, blue sky world. Okay. So this is how we will typically rephrase this sentence syntax wise. Again, this kind of syntax switching might not work as well if this is an actually an audiovisual translation project. So now, if the person, as they're describing the green grass, red roses, you're actually seeing the imageries on the screen, okay, going one by one. And then in the end, the character is actually taking a very meaningful pause to say with you. So imagine, let's say a girl asks a guy, what's your dream world like? And the person says, I want to live in a world where the grass is green, the roses are red, and the sky is blue with you. So now we're getting a different idea of what this text is about, right? And we should feel really warm and fuzzy inside because this is such an unexpected confession of romantic sentiments. So again, we cannot do the very chaotic reordering like we will usually do in our text-based translation because not only will the imageries not match with the utterance, we are also not having the pivotal with you moment because the last word in Chinese translation is actually world. Okay, so we're not getting the same effect at all. So again, what we're actually going to do is another kind of recasting. So now if I recast my translation and it becomes in my ideal world, there is green grass, red roses, blue sky, and you. You see what I did? So by really recasting the sentence according to the plot line, we are providing a really harmonious viewing experience. So what we talked about recasting is really not so much about syntax, grammar, or customary expressions in our own language just as a translation decision. The translation decision is actually made based upon the kind of viewer experience and the kind of creative intent that we're trying to honor. The third issue, segmented tunnel vision. So I'll quickly describe this issue for you just because every language is so different. But the central idea is that when you have a template provided for your subtitling work, the interface almost looks like your typical CAT tools, right? Your CAT, your computer assisted translation tools, which means you'll have the source text on one side and then the target text on the other side. But the problem is that because when people are translating, they're focusing on the horizontal equivalence, right? You're looking at a segment, you're translating it, so on and then so forth. And sometimes what I notice among translators is that they're only checking the horizontal equivalence when they're even when they're proofreading, but they're not actually seeing how everything flows vertically in their translation. You know, in actors, when they're acting, they actually do something called a table read before they start filming, which literally means they sit around a table and then they read their scripts out loud so that they can see the flow of every utterance. So this is the same mindset that we need to adopt. You don't necessarily need to read your text aloud, but definitely make sure that they are very readable as a speech and also that they're flowing beautifully vertically because, because that's how your viewers are consuming your content. Before we move on, here's a quick review of what we talked about in terms of script writing mindset. We talked about the importance of really honoring three of our kings, the text, the audio, and the visual to really make sure we're not making brash 
translation decisions before we understand the entirety of the context. And then we talked about the importance of following the storytelling order and not to have the kind of order switching that will disrupt the intended storytelling flow. And speaking of flow, we talked about the importance of really checking the vertical flow of your subtitles to see if they're actually coherent and they actually flow well, instead of just focusing on the line by line translation accuracy, because languages are so different. And sometimes we do not construct sentences in the same way. Now let's talk about the third segment, time frames and continuous play. So by time frames, I mean subtitles are very ephemeral. They're only supposed to last about as long as the audio length, right? So we want to make sure that we are working with that time restriction very well. And by continuous play, I mean when our audience is watching our show, we expect them to just sit back and relax. So we don't want them to have to pause because our subtitles are too long or too complex to read. So you probably guessed it in this segment, we're talking about how to create an effortless reading experience for our viewers. So the first common issue were common issues probably are wordiness and oversimplification. So these two are basically on the opposite ends of the spectrum. So based on my earlier description, it shouldn't surprise you that in subtitling concision is a really important concept. And do I like to say we want to treat character space as real estate because in real estate, every square footage costs money, right? So we don't want to buy a bigger house than we need. And who is footing the bill here? It's our viewers, right? Because they are paying with a very valuable resource, which is their attention. However, sometimes I see translators who might have gotten this idea a little twisted. So they are really shortening everything at the expense of a meaningfully full experience, which is not what we want. We actually do want to give our audience a full experience. So ultimately, concision is the combination of efficient writing and good judgment. So when we're doing subtitling, it's really essential to have this thought experiment or mindset of pretending that we do not speak the source language, because only with this new perspective can we truly put ourselves in the shoes of our viewers. So imagine you don't speak your source language and you're watching a show. Even though you don't understand what the people are saying, you can hear a lot of information still, right? You can hear the speed of the speech. You can hear the length of it. You can hear the syllable density, the emotion, tone, rhythm, pauses, parallelism, repetition, right? You can hear that without understanding the speech. Which is why in my own practice, I like to aim for this audio subtitle equivalence, which means I want to make sure that what my viewers are hearing is similar to what they're reading on the screen. So let me demonstrate that further with two examples on both ends of the spectrum. Now let's imagine we are working on a documentary. And as you know, sometimes they have scholars who are speaking extemporaneously. They are just formulating their thought as they speak. So in this case, just imagine somebody who is taking pauses and using filler words a lot as they are formulating their thought. So with this imagery, we can talk about what kind of transition decisions we should make. So some translators might be tempted to provide a shortened or more polished version in their subtitle translation because they think, you know, it's really important to create this effortless reading experience. So now I'm just doing all the hard work. I'm just taking out all the unnecessary parts. I'm just giving people the actual essential information. I understand this thought process, but if you are actually the viewer, what you're actually experiencing is that you're hearing the person on screen 
pausing and doing ums and ahs. However, in your subtitle, something just looks really short and polished. So it's very easy for the audience to tell from this discrepancy that they're not actually getting the most authentic translation. So instead, what we want to do is that we want to follow the rhythm and the pauses and break our subtitles into multiple chunks to really mimic the pauses of this original speaker. This way, we are actually providing our audience the kind of harmonious viewing experience that they're looking for. So the earlier example is when the source text is very wordy, right? And now let's go to the other end of the spectrum, which is when the source text is actually really short and snappy. You know, I'm usually the rambler, so I'm not very good at coming up with examples where people are being pithy and snappy. So I had to go into the real world to fish out this example for you. So I was watching this show on Netflix the other day. It's called Love is Blind. And this line caught my eye because it's exactly the kind of example that I was looking for. So the scenario here is that we have a young couple and they're having some issues in their marriage. So these four parents are basically having an intervention dinner to tell these two young people that they are hitting this rough patch and they should, you know, support each other and help each other through. And you will really start to appreciate just how pithy that sentence is now that you're really trying to unpack the idea for your translation. Because better or worse is in reference to the wedding vows, right? And to say that this is exactly the worst part that is in the better or worse, which is in the wedding vow. It's saying that this is exactly the point that you should support each other. Right? So now you see the current Chinese translation on Netflix. It says, you said you would support each other for better or worse, and this is one of the worst times. So you see how everything gets a little bit longer because the translator is trying to capture this bigger idea. Now, this is a fine translation because it captures the idea, you know, it conveys the meaning, and it doesn't exceed any reading speed limit. And as you can see, just how tight the Chinese characters are, right? But if we're looking at this translation from the point of view of a viewer experience, this might actually give us a different picture because your audience right now is hearing. We said, but if we're worse, this is worse. But what they're reading is 说好无论好坏都要互相扶持,这就是不好的时候. Can you feel it just feels so much longer even though you might not speak Chinese? Which is why it's so important to not just rely on the reading speed limitation, especially when your language direction shrinks in character space compared to your source language. So for example, as you see earlier in the Chinese example, even though the Chinese is actually so much longer character space wise, it's actually very similar to the English original. So in these cases, I usually see a lot of very wordy Chinese translations out there, but they're not being flagged by the machine because the machine doesn't really understand human reading experience. The machine is really just a series of numbers and series of calculation, right? So you want to make sure that you are the person who is actually watching out for the quality of your subtitle and not giving away the power to some machine that is not actually reading your subtitle. So if I were to work on this sentence, I will do something like this, which is a complete paraphrasing of this idea. Because again, it's the idea and the thought that counts in subtitle translation. So I will just rephrase the whole thing into this is a marriage, you know, circling back to the vow, wedding vow idea. And you should get through this hard time together, which is what essentially the mother-in-law is trying to say. And now this examine this new subtitle through the lens of your experience. You are hearing, we said better or worse, this is worse. And you are reading, 既然结了婚, Wouldn't you feel like this is a more harmonious and more satisfying tradition? 
And a little bonus trick here is that you might notice I'm also mimicking the rhythm a little bit. We said bad or worse, this is worse. 既然结了婚，就要共度难关。And this is a really good trick in building that kind of satisfying rendition that we're looking for, because. When we think about pleasure and a pleasurable experience, it's really just about all your senses experiencing the same thing, right? What you're watching, what you're reading, and what you're experiencing, everything is harmonious and everything is synchronized. So here are some additional examples of equivalent rhythm. So let's say somebody is talking to someone named Bruce and saying how he's really selfish. So she might go, "Everything's about you. Everything's about Bruce, right?" So if you can mimic the rhythm, you'll be better than just saying you only care about yourself, which is a fine translation and which might. Be something that you can only do given all the other restraints. But the idea is that if you can mirror the idea, you'll be really satisfying for your audience when you do that. And another example: let's say somebody says, "Call the hospital now!" Right? If you just say immediately call the hospital, that doesn't really have the same energy as the original. The second issue I want to highlight is not being mindful of shot changes. So a shot change is a really important concept in subtitling. So I want to make sure that we understand the importance of that and why we care about it so much. So what is a shot change? So imagine my hand is a camera, and right now I'm taking in footages, and whatever I'm taking in, wherever I. You know, angle my camera. This will be one shot because this is a continuous shot. However, when they're making movies, what you see actually is a whole bunch of cameras pointing at different directions, and they are splicing together the footages from different cameras. So that's how a shot change happens. And before I demonstrate to you what a shot change looks like, I want to give a quick shout out to our AVD member Marie Winnick for these two beautiful pictures that she took on an erupting Mount Etna in Italy in 2022. So now you see this angle; there will be one shot, and then this will be another shot. So that will be a shot change. So now pretend that we are watching. Um, a documentary about environment or clean energy, and now I'm going to do the voice. And when I play the next slide, just pretend that you're watching a documentary and start reading the subtitle. Okay? With advanced technology in renewable energy, we can create a better and a more beautiful world. So this is option one, and now option two. With advanced technology in renewable energy. We can create a better and a more beautiful world. So now the question is, which one did you like better, and why? I hope you will agree that in option two, it's easier to read and process when both the images and the subtitles refresh together. Right, so that's really the importance of shot changes. Of course, there are a lot of more trickier situations in the real world of subtitling, but I want to make sure that you understand why we care about this so much. And if you pay attention to movie editing, you will notice that a lot of times they tend to really make the cut at the period or at the. Comma of the sentence, so that is why this is something that we should pay attention to. The third issue I want to highlight is not proofreading properly. So first of all, definitely do proofread. It's really important to make sure that our subtitle work is without typos, grammar issues, or any other kinds of errors. But it's not enough to just proofread our subtitle. You want to make sure that you're actually putting on the video and watching your subtitles. With the video, because this is the only way you can gauge if your subtitles are truly good to go. Like I said earlier, it's not enough to just look at the technical parameters. It's not enough to just read it. You must put your subtitles to the test of the actual viewing environment, which is watching the video while your subtitles are on. Only 
through that process, can you really tell if your subtitles are easy enough for the audience to read and digest? You know the drill by now, we're going to do another review of what we talked about so far in this segment and the best practices for achieving better reading experience for our viewers. We talked about the importance of truly cultivating audience empathy and really putting ourselves in their shoes. So we want to make sure that there is a harmony and balance between what they are hearing and what they are reading. We also talked about the importance of not crossing shot changes whenever possible because they are very disruptive to the reading experience. And lastly, we talked about how we should not just proofread our subtitles, but also proof watch them. And now let's dive into our final segment, direction, reaction, and creative intent. So all this is to say that when we're working on an audiovisual file, it's really important to recognize that this is a combination and, and culmination of a lot of people's creative intent and creative artistry. So it's important that when we are doing our subtitling work, we're also honoring every bit of the creative intent. So this part is about creating an equivalent experience for our viewers. Equivalent to what, you might ask? Equivalent to the viewing experience a viewer might have if they speak the language and does not need subtitle or subtitle translation. So first, let me give you some examples of what I mean by creative intent. This is by no means an exhaustive list, but I just want to give you some ideas of what to look out for in your subtitling work. For example, if something is supposed to be suspenseful, cryptic, or vague, you want to keep it that way in your subtitling work too. Or sometimes a piece of information is not supposed to be revealed until later, so make sure that you're not spoiling that. Catchphrases are very essential for character building. If you watched the show Friends, you might recognize the very classic catchphrase by Janice, right? Oh my God. Or by Joey, how are you doing, right? The reason they're so memorable is because they are consistent and they are repeated all the time. Or sometimes this could be a theme of a movie. There might be some key words that are always getting repeated. So you want to make sure that you're paying attention and you're also rendering them consistently across the board. Camera work is also important to look out for. Let's imagine we are watching a detective show and there is a huge bookshelf in front of us. And one of the books, the title of that book is going to give us an important clue. But now, even when the book is actually in frame, it's not a good time to reveal the book title yet. right? We want to wait till the camera to do the zoom in, which is when the audience is supposed to find out about which book is giving out a clue that we also subtitle the title of the book so that people are finding out about a clue at the same time. Line delivery, which is very important to look out for, and I have a handy acronym for you. They spell out GIF to work and also do TGIF, whatever floats your boat. So they stand for gestures, intonation, facial expressions, and tone. So basically the idea is that you want to take a very holistic view of the on-screen acting to make sure that your translation really fits all the nuances of the acting decisions. Punchline, another key element. So in comedy, punchline is the line that ties the entire joke together, right? It's after the punchline that people start to laugh. So if we're subtitling for a comedy show, we want to make sure that we're timing things perfectly so we're not spoiling it to the point where the audience at home is laughing five seconds earlier than the audience in the studio. But this idea of punchline and no spoiling is actually not exclusive to comedy. This is actually a decision-making process that we should bear in mind all the time when we are doing subtitling work. And we'll talk more about that in the next segment. In subtitling, if we want to avoid spoilers, what we want to do is that we want to be very 
intentional with our segmentation and our timing. Imagine all the audio input as water flowing through a faucet, and our job is to find the right container to contain it so that we can subtitle it, right? So sometimes I notice that there are translators who are watching how much the vessel can hold instead of watching the flow of the water, which is the flow of the storyline. And I will show you an example so you understand this very obscure analogy. Let's say we have a general who is giving a powerful speech to his soldiers, and he's taking very deliberate pauses in between, uh, looking around at the soldiers, and we're seeing the soldiers' stern looks and determination. Now, the people who are thinking from the perspective of the container will do something like this. So here you see the entire line is being subtitled all at once because the people who are focusing on the container are thinking, oh, it's just a very short sentence. I can fit everything in one line. But this is not conducive to our viewing experience because the creative intent behind this acting and the script writing is that we want to really get riled up by the speech as it goes on, as it unfolds. So by having all the content in one line, you're essentially giving away this entire speech before it's unfolded in the way it tends to be. So instead, we should do something like this. And the red bars are just for you to see that these are where we'll put the segmentations of the subtitles. So these are three separate subtitles. I just want to make sure that nobody is misunderstanding this to be one subtitle of three lines. Okay, so these are three separate subtitle events. And these are just some other examples of the same idea, which is to be very intentional of how we segment our subtitles so that we're withholding the information until it's time for it to be revealed. So for example, let's say somebody says, we love hanging out with each other. And then there's going to be a twist most of the time. Right, so we want to have them as two separate subtitles so that people are not spoiled of the punchline. And similarly, I have great news to share. Eee, I got into Harvard. So again, you don't want this to be one subtitle. You want people to find out as the plot unfolds. Similarly, if a fashionista is trying to put together an outfit and she says, these go well with walking around and say, ah, oh, that dress, right? We don't want to spoil the entire line. Or if somebody says, is it yummy? And the other person nods. And then that's why you make the decision to get the same flavor of the ice cream. So again, your reaction is a reaction to your friend's reaction. So if we have everything in one line, it's almost like you're missing a beat. Similarly, let's imagine somebody shows up at your door and he says, I have a gift for you. And then he's going to take his time reaching into his pocket and then the audience is going to see the gift and then he's going to extend his hand and say, for your birthday, right? So this is like a very deliberate process. So we cannot just have this in one subtitle because you're spoiling the tempo. And also worse, you don't want to say something like, I have a birthday gift for you for this entire line, right? That is not the right tempo for this story. Similarly, if somebody is looking for Jason and then she opens the door, sees something shocking, and then she's going to react and say, what are you doing? Okay, it's very different from having a one line subtitle that says, Jason, what are you doing? That is not the right storytelling. 
Similarly, one thought at a time. Let's say somebody is talking to her friends, saying, oh yeah, it was so much fun, the party was so fun. And then maybe she notices in the corner of her eyes, somebody is behaving very suspiciously. So we want to also refresh this subtitle in a sense, right? Because this is a new beginning of another plot line. And similarly, if somebody says, where's your father? So this is directed to the son. And then this person is going to go around the house looking for a husband saying, Tom, Tom, Tom. So that's directed to the husband. So it's more clear and better to read if we can just separate these two instead of putting them together because that might be a little bit confusing for your audience at first. And now this is our final issue, misusing dual speaker dashes. So let's first talk about the correct usage of dual speaker dashes. Why do we even have dual speaker dashes? So let's say two people are greeting each other. They say, hi, how are you? Good, how are you? And this happens really fast, right? Because this is such a perfunctory greeting. So we cannot have two sequential subtitles in this case just because everything is going way too fast because it will be very disorienting for our viewers to say hi how are you good how are you to actually read the subtitle translation right because the time is too short so that's why we have something called dual speaker dashes to make sure we can borrow time from each other so this way we can have one subtitle box and people can actually read the conversation and now let's assume two kids are fighting over a toy and they are overlapping each other in terms of their audio so give me to my mind they're saying this at the same time so again we cannot have two sequential subtitles which is why we have the dual speaker dashes to make sure people can actually read both of the utterances Another good usage of dual speaker dashes is when a bunch of people are saying the same thing together, like happy birthday in this case. Now let's talk about the incorrect usage. Because we call this dual speaker dash, sometimes people are under this misconception that we use the dashes every time there are two speakers involved. So sometimes I'll see dialogues that are always connected by dual speaker dashes. So you don't even need to read the content of this example. The idea is just that every time the first person starts speaking, every time the first person is subtitled, we already know what the second person is going to say. But that is not what we want. Again, we're not supposed to spoil things. We want to create the equivalent experience as the story unfolds. So this will be a really extreme example of misusing dual speaker dashes because we're not supposed to spoil a marriage proposal like this. We have to time these separately. So will you marry me will be one event uh, to wait until the woman says yes to subtitle that yes. Okay, and this is another example of misusage because the actual order of the utterances is, is the car unlocked? Yes, get in. Okay, so we're not supposed to do this sort of zigzagging of our audience's case because they don't even understand how they're supposed to parse this. Again, they don't speak the original language. They don't know how to parse the sentence as it is. So I want to make sure that we are giving them the right order to read this dialogue. And here is our final review of what we talked about in terms of the best practices for honoring creative intent. I give you some examples of the essential storytelling elements. We talked about how to be really intentional and thoughtful with our segmentation and timing and in relation to that, we talked about the correct usage of dual speaker dashes. It's really important to realize that we are using the dashes because we're trying to solve problems because we cannot otherwise have two sequential subtitles. So that is not an ideal situation. It's just something that we have to do to solve the problem. 
Now there you have it. So in this presentation, we talked about the four sets of unique characteristics of audiovisual translation, which gave us the four cornerstones of your experience in subtitling. So by now, maybe you're feeling a little bit overwhelmed because we talked about a lot of issues and a lot of pointers for best practices. But let's see if this helps. You see, the idea of removing any sense of jarringness for our audience is truly the core of this presentation and the core of viewer experience. I've just been attacking this idea from all different angles. Whether it's our translation, the way we create the characters with our words, or the way we examine if our subtitles are easy to read, or the way that we honor the creative intent, it's all about achieving harmony and synchronization with the actual film. So we want to make sure that everything that we do is based on the idea for our audience to enjoy the show. Thank you so much for watching this educational video. I hope you find this helpful and you're very welcome to get in touch and let me know if you have any comments or questions. Thank you so much and have a good day.